And we're actually going to start off with a hand that I played several months ago, which I think is going to demonstrate, obviously, one of the key, key concepts and key cornerstones of maximizing uh, what I feel like your win rate is in, uh, in No Limit Hold'em for sure. And, you know, it's something that I try to stress all the time. So let's get into it here. Multi-worlds theory here. So um, let's get into it here. So let's take a look at a hand that I recently played. And this is definitely going to demonstrate one of the cornerstones of like live no limit play specifically I would say sort of at like the 2-5 level and I mean sort of at the smaller 2-5 level like I played this hand actually way back in LA from a few months ago and it was when I was uh, waiting for a different game it's actually usually 5-5 five, five in LA so it's a 5-5 five, five, and we were only 500 effective but I understand that 2-5s play different they play larger in some places things like that and uh, but this is Obviously, two. Uh, this is five five, and it's a pretty pretty big drop structure in LA as well. So we're six hundred dollars effective. Want you to look at positional awareness, things like that. So basically, what ends up happening is that one player limps in from plus one for five dollars. The cutoff limps, and I look down on the button with pocket aces, ace of hearts, ace of clubs, and of course I cover everyone. So six hundred effective. Both guys actually have the same amount of money. Six hundred effective. I cover both players, and uh, I look down at ace-ace with the ace of clubs. Ace of clubs is going to be slightly irrelevant. So I obviously raise here to 25, and they both call. Normally what I'll do at this level is usually I will straight open a 4x, and then what I'll do is um, I would normally uh, usually add $5 to each limper. But the thing here is is that these guys weren't super deep and sometimes even exploitively with my really premium hands will actually size down a little bit just because I don't want them to fold. I want them to make, I want them to hit top pair. So maybe I would have made it 30, but I made it 25 and they both ended up calling. So they both call, you know, and I'm kind of loving life because these guys are definitely, definitely recreational players. So we go to the flop, and it's a pretty good flop for me. Not that there's many bad flops for me. But the board comes out, queen of clubs, seven of clubs, three of spades. So queen, seven, three, two clubs. I've got aces with the ace of clubs. Check, check. Comes over to me. I bet 35. I probably could have bet a little bit more, maybe 40 or 40, 45. But again, I didn't want to lose these guys. Uh, you know, I've got the ace of clubs in my hand, which means no one can have the nut flush draw. But this is really where it's important here in terms of positional awareness and hand reading, the first limper calls. And he wasn't playing like super duper loose. Like he's not going to turn over like queen deuce or something like that. So he calls and the other guy folds. So positional awareness would say that, and you can't always tell this depending on the player, but it's very difficult for the guy to call here when he's not heads up with the guy behind him, unless he has like a flush draw here or a queen. Like, it's really difficult here to call with, like, a hand like 7 6 suited if you limped in. I mean, obviously, we see that it's possible, but usually when somebody calls next to act with the player behind them, they should be much stronger than if they were to close the action or you were just heads up in general, right? By yourself. So I bet 35. He calls, the other guy folds. And I'm still loving life here as the pot is 145. And I know I sort of blocked the flush draws, and it's probably unlikely that he does have a flush draw. Notice that the queen of clubs is also out there, so it would have to be like king jack of clubs, king ten of clubs, you know, something like that. So we go to the turn, the turn's a five of hearts, which really doesn't change anything. It's a great card for me, and I'm definitely thinking that this guy's most likely holding is queen X. So he checks, and I'm like, this guy's not going to really fold here with the pot being 145. So I decide to bet 115. So hero bets 115. And the guy doesn't think about it too long. And uh, plus one calls. All right, so we had 230 here onto the turn. So now the pot is 375. And uh, we rolled the river. And really, I mean, there's not a whole lot of bad rivers for me here besides maybe a queen. But even on a club, with me having the ace of clubs, his hand really sort of, um, you know, 
sort of leans towards queen x when you take a look at what people really play here like king queen queen jack if all these guys are like open limping with all the offsuit combos at this recreational level that's 16 hands of each combo king queen king jack i mean uh, excuse me king queen queen jack and uh, to a lesser extent ace queen with one queen out there it's still 12 combos of king queen 12 combos of queen jack uh, you know, another, because I've got two of the aces in my hand, so there's two aces, it's like six combos of ace-queen if he limps in with them, so there's a lot of queens out there, queen-ten, things like that. So we go to the river, and the river's a six of diamonds. So, again, for all you guys uh, on the podcast, uh, five, five, six hundred, effective, plus one limps for five, cut off limps, I make it 25 with ace of hearts, ace of clubs from the button, blinds fold, both the limper calls, Queen of clubs, seven of clubs, three of spades. Check, check. I bet 35. Call, fold. Pot's 145. The, uh, excuse me, the pot is, um, I think, it, yeah, the pot is, yeah, the pot is 145. Turns the five of hearts. Check. And hero bets 115 and plus one call. So we add another 230 on here and the pot now is 375. And now the river's the six of diamonds. So it's queen, seven, three, five, six. And here is the crux of this hand. So, plus one checks. And what do we do here? Plus one checks. Well, if you've been listening to any of my stuff for any period of time, you know that I like to make you know, value bets that are absolutely as thin as possible, right? And one of the concepts that I often will talk about on my training site, Crush Live Poker, of course, is that especially down at these levels where the check raise bluffing frequency is basically no a lot of these guys they don't know what the word polarization means polarized means you know you're either very strong or very weak but because people play in such a predictable pattern where when especially on the river when they're in position on the river they will check back a lot of hands and just take the pot if they think they're good, like at showdown. They don't want to open the betting back up. So when they bet the river in position, they become inherently polarized, meaning very strong or they're bluffing, okay? Even though they're not supposed to. Because so many people play that way, these other guys sort of subconsciously observe that a lot of people are polarized when the board comes out basically with a one-liner here to a straight. So if you were to bet yourself here, you are going to get looked up by a queen. You're going to get looked up by a queen because these guys are going to think, this guy must have missed a flush draw or he's bluffing. He's not going to bet one pair here at the end. You bet for value and you're going to get called a lot. Another thing here too is, is that because we've got two aces in our hand, it's actually better than even if we were to have, say, king, queen, or ace, queen because it gives our opponent more of an opportunity to have a queen. We unblock a queen. So I'm thinking about this. The pot's 375. I don't want to go insane. I mean, the guy's got like, you know, about 400 to 450 left, something like that. I decide to bet uh, 285 at the end. I sort of leave him with some money. So hero bets 285, and I'm still sort of going along with that thought like, this guy's definitely going to call me with a queen. He's going to think, you know, I'm polarized. And uh, he thinks about it. He's kind of coughing up. You know, he's like, ah. Oh. And then he uh, finally calls. Now, when he puts on this little sort of pause for a few seconds, and then he finally calls, I definitely think I have the best hand for sure. Definitely think I have the best hand for sure. I turn over my hand aces, and he thinks about, he looks at it, and then he turns over five, six of clubs. So... He flopped a combo draw here with a flush draw and a gut shot here to a four with a flush draw, turned to five, continued to call, river to six for two pair, and he won the pot. This gets the whole point of the video. Does that mean that my bet was bad? Absolutely not. If you want to win large in no limit and you want to be an effective value better at the end, you must value own yourself a good portion of the time. Now, what does that mean, value own? Value own means you must bet for value in position with the worst hand a good portion of the time if you are going to get called, meaning that you need to make value bets, and when you're called, you need to not have the best hand some of the time. Now, people might think, about, what, Bart, why would you, you want to do that? Because here's the thing, 
if when you are value betting, value betting, not bluffing, but if when you are value betting and when you're called, you always have the best hand, that means that there are plenty of other situations where you have the best hand would have been called, but you're checking behind. And I would say 80 to 90% of the people at this level in that particular in this particular hand will just check behind and take a showdown. You cannot do that if you are making value bets and when you're called, you're called you're good like 90% of the time, you're missing a ton of value. You should be making value bets with hands when called that are good 60, 65% of the time. And the reason why I use that 60 to 65% is because it's a little bit complicated with the sizing because it is sizing dependent too, because if you're betting the worst hand for value and you get called, you lose with sizing. That's why I sort of go with the 60 to 65%. If I'm betting for value with the hand and when I'm called, I'm good 65% of the time, I'm gonna be making a lot of money with value bets versus the guy who only bets when he's good close to 100% of the time and he's checking back those times uh, when he's good between say the 65 to 100%. He's just checking all the hands back, or we'll say 65 to 90, right? He's checking that though that range of hands back and not getting the value for his hand that I am. So I think this hand is played perfectly okay. I'm not pissed off that the guy had 5-6. I think it's a great example of thin value betting, but specifically, you need to value own yourself if you want to be a good no-limit hold'em player. If you like what you've seen here, please hit the subscribe button. And if you enjoyed this call in hand, hit the like button down below. To check out CrushLivePoker.com, click on the link in the description. Use the code YTA300 to get the first 30 days for free.